1 Peter chapter 2, where we are considering the behavior of the witness or practicing theology. And there is a practice theology. There is a place where the rubber meets the road. The things that we learn in God's word have to find out. They have to find their working out in the life of the one who believes those things. And by the way, Jesus said that if you believe the truth that God has given in his word, it will show itself working out in your life. Jesus said it very simply, by your fruits, you will know them. By their fruits, you will. And uh, it's possible that people can struggle and, and have difficulty. It seems like we can go through times of barrenness in our life. But if the life of Christ is in you, God is going to make sure you bear some fruit. He is. He's going to do that. And he's going to bring that fruit forth to maturity. Say, how do you know that? Well, that's not my message today. Read John chapter 15. That's how I know. You will bring forth much fruit if you take it to the Lord in prayer and allow Christ to manifest his life in you. That's what Jesus said, John chapter 15. But we're in 1 Peter 2. I got to get back to uh, where we are. 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 9 through 12, if you'll follow along with me. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they might, may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It is that necessary spiritual food that we need to take in daily, not just on Sunday when we hear the message, but Lord, I pray that we would heed the words of our Lord Jesus a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I pray that we would, like Job, esteem your words more than our necessary food. For lo, Father, if we are ignoring the pages of Scripture on a daily basis from Monday through Saturday, how malnourished and starving our spirit is. But Lord, I thank you that through your word our eyes are opened and your word gives us light and life that we might go forth in the wonderful truth, living our faith in the truth you've given to us, even as we've placed our faith in Jesus Christ. Guide us this morning, I pray with thanksgiving, in Jesus' name, amen. As we see here in verse 11, Peter's reminding those believers, largely Jewish believers, and if you read the opening chapters of the book of Acts, you're reminded that the early believers at one point were all Jewish believers, every single one of them. When Peter preached the gospel there at the temple in Jerusalem, it was Jews who placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And it was not until there was persecution and the Jews began to spread throughout the Roman Empire that the word of salvation in Jesus Christ began to make its way to others, Gentiles. Of course, the Lord, in a very powerful way, demonstrating his holy will, gave Peter a vision in Acts chapter 10 and told Peter, by way of a vision, do not call that which is unclean, unclean, when God calls it clean. I said it like that because, according to the Old Testament, everything Peter saw in the sheet was unclean. It was all unclean, unclean. But God said, if I declare it clean, don't you call it unclean. Now that indicates to us that God has a plan and a program for this age where there's been some changes. There's been some very real changes. And that change has included the gospel. 
going forth to the whole world, Jew and Gentile. That change means now that instead of God manifesting his glory in an edifice built by the Jews, first, of course, in the wilderness, the skins and, and, uh, and the furniture inside that tabernacle. But later on, Solomon built the mighty edifice, the temple, and God manifested his glory there. But not today. There's a change. God, as we read here in 1 Peter chapter 2, as we've rehearsed in Ephesians chapter 2, God is manifesting his presence in the life of the believer in Jesus Christ. Christ in you, Paul says in Colossians, the hope of glory. Christ, who is our life, has not only appeared, but according to Romans 8, he's come to live within, dwell within the believer in Jesus Christ. And to what end? Well, Peter here wants us to understand that we're now pilgrims and strangers in this land. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we become citizens of heaven. And as citizens of heaven, we are now ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We go forth and we are telling people what God has to say, what God thinks. And aren't you glad you have the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, so that you can tell people with authority, thus saith the Lord? Don't tell them your opinion. I don't want to tell them my opinion. I want to tell them what God has said. Jesus Christ said, I not only pray for the 11, but I also pray for all who will believe on God through their word. And they have written it down, and the proclamation of the gospel has continued all these centuries. And here we are today, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. For what purpose? That we might be a witness that we might be a testimony that God has sent his son into this world, Jesus Christ, to save sinners from their sin. What a wonderful message we have as ambassadors for Christ. You need to get reconciled with God. If you don't, you have nothing to face but the judgment, the fires of eternal judgment that are prepared for Satan and his angels, but will receive all who reject Jesus Christ. Thus says God's word. And so, as believers, we want to be careful what? Verse 12. Well, verse 11, first of all, just by review, we want to be careful, number one, that we are responsible to keep our heart and life pure, free from sin, sin, abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. That's number one, practical outworking of this truth that we're believers in Jesus Christ members of the body of Christ. Number two is what we want to continue looking at, verse 12, is having our conduct honorable among the Gentiles. One, one, comment, uh, one, one translation has put it this way, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Does God care about how we live when we go out of this place? There's many a Christian who doesn't seem to know that. We think that we come into the assembly of the believers, and oh, we put on our tie and our coat, and we fix our hair just so, and it's Sunday, and we act a certain way, and behave a certain way, and talk a certain way. And sadly, when people go out into their home or in their place of work, into their families, why the conversation, the words that flow out of their mouth are, well, they're a little different out there than they are here. Brethren, it ought not to be so. Peter writes to us, keep your conversation, that is your conduct, the King James uses the word conversation, keep your conduct, your mode of living, your way of living, keep it excellent for the Lord. Now, how do we know what is excellent? The answer is we take our standard from God himself. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good and then show in our lives that the Lord is good. Now, we are very thankful that God has done something wonderful in the life of the believer, and that is God has sent his spirit into our hearts to dwell in the life of the believer in Jesus Christ so that by walking in the spirit yielded to God, he will bring forth his life, the life of his son in us so that we will be fruitful in these areas of what? Putting to death the works of the flesh and allowing the fruit 
of God, his love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. He'll bring them forth in abundance in the believing heart. Do you believe that? He sent forth his spirit into our hearts to be our leader, to lead us and guide us in the ways of God, to bring forth fruit in the believing heart. And so Peter is saying, keep, keep your behavior, your conduct, what you say, what you do, keep it excellent. Now, Peter uses this word, behavior or conduct, as we have it in the New King James, nine times. He's the number one New Testament author to use this very important word. I have heard a message making a case for the fact that this Greek word, anastrophe, not that that matters, conduct is a very good uh, uh, translation, uh, conduct. This word speaks of culture. What is culture? Well, culture is a new word, by the way, relatively speaking. It didn't even come into use until the late 1700s. Culture. If you go look at Noah Webster's dictionary, which I did, Culture only talks about farming and, 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 and working the land, culturing the land. It's an agricultural term. That's what it uh, was meant. But later on, that word came to be used in, in English speaking to speak of the way of life of a certain people. And, and people have noticed that different peoples in different countries and lands have different cultures. Now, to be sure, there are some things that are the same in every culture, and there are other things that are different. But a culture is just the way that you live. It's your mode of living. And by the way, the way that you live is based on what you believe. What you believe works it out in what you do, how you do it, when you do it, why you do it. And do you know that believers, according to the scriptures, have a culture? There is a such thing as Christian culture. Let me show you. Uh, the Word of God speaks about this importantly. Let's first of all turn back to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18, and let's talk about our conduct, our behavior before we trusted in Jesus Christ as our Savior. 1 Peter 1, 18, this is now review from our study. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless, what do you see there? Conduct, your aimless conduct. Your aimless conduct received notice by tradition from your fathers. And we talked about that. The culture in different lands is received from one generation to the next, and it's based on what they believe. One generation passes along to the next generation what they believe and uh, why they do what they do. And the next generation either embraces it and lives it and keeps the culture going, or they reject it, and some peoples begin to change their culture. Inevitably, there's some change of culture as you go along in every people and land. And the Word of God tells us here that all unbelievers in all cultures, wherever you are, whatever land, whatever language, whatever darkness of brown the color of your skin is, because that's really all it really is. People used to say red, yellow, black, and white, but now science has told us there's just white, brown, browner, 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 and some people call the brownest black, but it's just more brown. That's what science has revealed. There's no question about it. Scripture was way ahead of the science. Acts chapter 17, from one blood, God has made every person who lives on this earth. And you have more in common biologically than you have in difference. But that's funny, because we live in a time when if your skin is more brown than my skin, we think that because of our cultures are different, that we're wholly different peoples. I'm here to tell you, you have more com in common with them than you have in difference with them. You know that? And if you think about it, you realize you have two ears and they do too. You've got two eyes and they do too. You've got one nose and they do too, except, of course, for people who have had an injury or a birth defect or something like that. But lo and behold, you have ten toes and they do too. And you'd be surprised 
how many things they think alike, though there are many things that they may think differently. But God says all of the cultures of unbelievers, he sums it up in verse 18 of chapter 1 with one word, aimless. And I dare say there's a person or two who might take issue with the statement that unbelievers in Jesus Christ, that their life is without purpose, that it is worthless or it's aimless. As a matter of fact, I can prove this. I challenge you to go up to your unsaved neighbors and friends and tell them, tell them this very truth, 1 Peter 1.18, your life is aimless and see what they say. Are you an ambassador for Christ? Or are you beholden to a fear of men? It doesn't matter what you think or I think. It only matters what God says. What does God say about the life of an unbeliever? It's aimless. The word is vanity, empty. And again, if we look at it from the point of view of men, and we look it out, we say, his life is not aimless. He became a doctor. He became a lawyer. She became a doctor. She became a lawyer. They accomplished great good in their endeavors. I think of people who have uh, built tunnels through mountains with no electrical engineering, just a piece of steel and a hammer and this blessed mind God gave to each and every person. Amazing feast. How can you say they lived an aimless life? My answer is consider what God thinks and how God looks at it. What is revolution, rev, Revelation, sorry, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11 say? Why did God create you? For his purpose and for his glory. That's the purpose of every single person's existence. Did you do it for self or did you do it for God? Well, some people do choose a shorter, nobler purpose. They do it for the betterment of men. That's a wonderful cause. But it falls short of the glory of God, does it not? As far as God is concerned, if you don't honor him and praise him and bless him, you are missing the point of why he brought you into this world and your life apart from praising God, is aimless. That's what God says. Your life is aimless. So would you agree with me that 1 Peter 1.18 is looking at it from God's point of view, not yours and mine? As an unbeliever, your life is missing the point. And worse, if you reject the gospel, you are fighting against the very reason you exist. And you wonder why suicide rates go up why divorce is rampant? Why is there perversion of every kind? Pride that is moving at an escalated rate that causes shame in any thinking heart? Because mankind has chosen to live for self rather than for God. In America, we've embraced the religion of secular humanism and we worship at the altar of man, and it is aimless, worthless, empty, and we bear the fruits of it. Just go down to any pharmacy and watch people fill their bottles. Now, please, when I say that, I'm not saying that all medicine is bad and that you shouldn't take medicines. It's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is people are taking psychotic medicines of such strength today because they can't take the pain and the hurt that's in their heart. Or worse, they can't deal with the sinful habits that they've so long embraced in their life that now their life is just broken. And anyone in the family or neighborhood can tell you something's not right with that person. There's a brokenness there. They've embraced habits, and now they're just trying to cover it with a pill. That's the fruit of the religion of secular humanism. Look with me at Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four, God says this in his word. And, and some may say, boy, pastor, this is not a pretty, you're sending out, me out of here to be encouraged, right? <laughs> this doesn't sound too encouraging. Dear friend, if you and I who have trusted in Jesus Christ as our savior cannot comprehend this truth, it's why we are feeble and frail to say, be ye reconciled to God. 
Because I want to tell you, the fruit of God is love. And the fruit of God is joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. There's no human law that contradicts it. It's the wonderful, majestic expression of the life of Jesus Christ. Do you have it? You know, if you go up to a, a living plant and you cut it, it flows with the juices of the sap that are within it. Those very juices, the sap that is used by the plant to feed the production of the fruit. How about you? If someone were to cut you off spiritually, do you flow with the sap of the juices of the life of Jesus Christ? God wants to manifest that in us. Notice here in, in Ephesians chapter 4, I want to draw your attention to verses 17, 24. Once again, Paul is talking about the same thing as Peter before someone trusted in Jesus Christ. Verse 17, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer, believers in Jesus Christ, no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, are you ready? In the futility of their mind. The emptiness and the vanity, the word mind here means thinking, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. They are strangers to God's life. Why? Verse 18 tells us because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Do you know one of the most powerful ways to blind is a bright light? Did you know that? We often think of blindness in the darkness, and in the text here, it does speak of the darkness of blindness. And by the way, when you get blinded, that's what you are. It's dark. <laughs> but if you were to look at the sun, and don't do it, that bright light will damage your eyes. But even if you have a bright LED that you hold up, you could look at it this way. When you wake up in the middle of the night, do you have a night light on or do you flip on all your most powerful 100 watt light bulbs? It's LEDs now, it's not incandescent bulbs anymore. What does it do when you flip on those lights in the darkness? It blinds you. Mankind is blinded by his ignorance to God. How can you be ignorant? Do you know ignorance involves a decision? Peter, in 2 Peter, will call it willful ignorance. They choose. I don't want to know that. Well, if you turn away from the light, it's pretty dark. So you go in search of another light. Secular humanism is the bright light that man is holding up. Now, in comparison to the truth of God, I want to tell you, secular humanism is no light at all. It's like holding your... Get, get your mo tactical flashlights are some of the most powerful beams you can get today. You know, they advertise how many beams. It's nothing new, by the way. When I was young, uh, my friend bought me for a birthday present one time a flashlight that was four feet long. I wish I still had that flashlight. The lens on it was like this big around. And you could put so many D-cell batteries into that light that when you turned it on at night, you could sit, shine it on the clouds and notice a little faint glow on it. Yeah, yeah. And that was just an incandescent bulb. All of it pales in comparison to the sun, doesn't it? The bright light of God puts every other light of man to rest. But I want to tell you something. I never took that light and turned it around and shined it in my eyes. It would blind me. That's what mankind does with their ignorance to God. They blind themselves with some other light. The blindness that is in their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. I, that, I felt like I just read the headlines of every single newspaper in America today. I felt like I just read to you the six o'clock news. It's sad. But the Word of God tells us that's the result of ignorance to the life of God. And that's where we were, verse 17, before we trusted in Christ. And by the way, 
Paul, like Peter, is urging believers, don't walk that way anymore. That means you could, and sadly, some believers do, walk according to the aimless conduct that they once had before they came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's a sad picture. It's not God's desire, verse 20, but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your, notice these next three words, please, your former conduct. The old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Before you were saved, you had a culture. There's an unbelieving, unsaved culture, and it's not pretty. Verse 19 tells us it's a culture that thinks it's great to give yourself over to lewdness. That's, that's commendable to give yourself over to impurity, to give yourself over to perversion. There's a culture. It's the culture of the sinful heart that says perversion, give yourself over to it. In our American sociology textbooks across the land today, it is taught that we should praise every kind of human sexual perversion and we should laud it. The Word of God tells us this is vanity, aimless, gross living that is ignorant of the life of God. It's ignorant. And as believers, we're to put that off. We are to do what? Be renewed, verse 23, in the spirit of our mind. God wants to change the way we think. And believers have to comprehend that our thinking needs to change, Romans 12, 1 and 2. By the renewing of your mind, you prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The very way we think, God wants to change it. Verse 23, and that you put on the new man. Oh yes, there's a new culture. There's a new behavior that's a product of Christ in you. That your new nature that you have as a believer, your new man, will willingly and gladly embrace if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you open your heart to it. Yes, that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. That is a description of our believing culture or the conduct that we are to have now that we are in Christ. Well, what I want to pull away from these verses is the believer is alive with the life of God. But unbelievers are not. They're ignorant of it. And they're futile. They're empty in their thinking. We're told in 1 Corinthians 2.14 that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. What I'm talking about is foolish out there. And they think it's strange that you do not run with them to their excess, to their overflow of wickedness. Remember verse 19, uh, this lewdness, uncleanness with greediness with greed in their heart. They think it's strange that you don't do that. That's just normal behavior. Not if you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're a new creation. And God says, old things have passed away. All things have become new. But don't be surprised. Believers ought to recognize that out there in the world, and this is so important for children who've been saved at a young age in their home. Out there in the world... They have a different goal. They have a different motivation. And though, just like different cultures of the world, there are similarities, there's lots of similarities. I'm a believer, and I'm happy to tell you I, I love to eat, I enjoy eating, and I eat. And they do too. There's a lot of things we have in common. But through faith in Jesus Christ, there are now a lot of things that have changed and I have a purpose in my life. What's that purpose? To bring glory to God in my life. So when I eat, it's different than when an unbeliever eats, though there may be a lot of things that are the same. We may be even eating the same food. But there's still a difference. Because whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, 
do all to the glory of God. That's a part of a believing culture, our behavior. It's, it's a culture that eats in righteousness. It's a culture that eats in holiness. And, and please notice here one more thing from verse 22 about that old former conduct. The old man, which is true of unbelievers out there, aimless in their conduct, their behavior. Please notice these words, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. You may wonder why some believers live a holier life than others. And this verse will tell you why. Are you presenting yourself to the Lord as a living sacrifice? Conversely, you may wonder why some unbelievers are more wicked and lewd than other unbelievers. Do you ever wonder that? The answer is right here. In verse 22, that old nature can grow corrupt in both a believer and an unbeliever. Do you realize that people who give themselves over to the sins of the flesh grow more evil and wicked in the sins of the flesh? Oh, yes. And this is where even the sins of the father can be visited upon the children if the children embrace the sins of the father and go further with the sins of the father, their fathers. Oh, yes. Why do some people, why do some people behave in such perverted ways when there are other unbelievers who know, whoa, I draw the line there. Well, answer number one is God has given us all a conscience, Romans chapter 2. And every person, saved or unsaved, has a conscience. The law of God is written in their hearts. And the world, by the way, can't get away from it. They know that there's a right and a wrong. They know they ought to do what's right. But there are some people who just willfully choose to cross the line of the conscience and give themselves over to the lusts of the flesh which war against the soul and drag a person down into unspeakable degradation and wickedness. You're seeing it in America today. In Genesis chapter 6, God destroyed all mankind on the earth with a global flood. It actually took place in 7, 8, and 9, but God's assessment takes place in Genesis chapter 6. The thoughts of mankind were only evil continually, running to every wickedness and evil, bringing forth a kind of perversion when God said, that's it, I'll destroy them all. And aren't you thankful that God's word says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord? Thank you, Lord, because God had to judge the whole of human race. Why? For these very things that we're talking about. The old man, that behavior can grow corrupt. It grows corrupt. How? The answer is right there in the verse. Deceitful lusts. There are desi desires that deceive you, especially when people are telling you, just do it. If it feels good, just do it. That's not what the word of God says. God's word says, thou shalt not. Why? Because God in his infinite wisdom knows the depths of the depravity of a human heart and just how far a person will go if they give themselves over to sin. You know, if you're driving down the road and, and you see a sign that says, detour, turn here. Well, today more and more people don't want to turn at that detour, especially if they can't see any reason why. I don't see any reason why to detour. They want to see the big orange and white blockade, and they want to see the, the, the digger that's beyond it excavating a huge hole in the road. Oh, I better detour. I don't want to go there. But I'm here to tell you there are people today who don't even care when they see that. This very morning I saw a guy on his bicycle coming down the road in the middle of the street crossing diagonally across the intersection and then riding down the middle of the street on his bicycle in the opposite direction of all the traffic. And my heart went, Ugh! it's like he's riding for death, which he is. But to see the look on his face, it was a prideful look, a get out of my way. That's where our culture goes. Why? Because, because the word of God tells us that our old man grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. I wonder if he had a mother. I don't know. I wonder if he had a mother who hold his, held his hand and said, look both ways before you cross the street. 
Praise God if you have a mom like that. What a wonderful thing to teach people that there are standards, and if you pass them, you're giving yourself over to a growing danger. And of course, here, the scripture is talking about the sinful lusts in the heart of man. And uh, I remember being told by an old preacher, if you turn from the light, if you turn from the light and walk away from it, the darkness is very deep, very, very deep. This is our nation. But we are to learn something from this. Turn with me, please, to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 7. There is an aimless conduct, behavior, and the unsaved world is very much aware of it. As a matter of fact, they're living in it. They're delving into it. They're pushing the envelope of it. They're causing it to grow in their lives because they've been deceived by it. They think it's good. They think it's wonderful until they taste the bitter fruit of the end of it. And then they cry out for help when they taste the bitter end of the path they've chosen. Here in 2 Peter, please, chapter 2, verse 7, notice what God says uh, in 2 Peter chapter 2, where Peter's warning of destructive doctrines in his day and reverting back to examples from the Old Testament. Uh, there were false prophets in the Old Testament. There are false teachers today. Beware. Don't let false prophets and false teachers deceive you. Notice, um, uh, let's see, I want to begin in verse 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, ashes, that was the judgment of God, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who would after live ungodly and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by what kind of conduct? The filthy conduct of the wicked. The filthy con Don't be deceived. Dear brother and sister in Christ, don't be deceived if you've been saved. God has transformed you and made you a child of his. And your behavior is called, God calls it out that your behavior is to be different than the world's behavior. So what is a person to do? Because remember in John chapter 17, Jesus said, I do not take, I'm no longer in the world, but these are. God's not taking us out of the world. He's left us here in the midst of this darkness to be a witness, to be a light, to be a testimony. And if you run with them, with the same behavior of the unjust, the unrighteous, the wicked, it will be just as destructive in a believer's life as it is in an unbeliever's life. God wants us to be a testimony of light. What kind of behavior was present in Sodom and Gomorrah? Filthy behavior. And that's what happens with the wicked. They run to this. And so that's why the word of God tells us what to do. What are we to do as believers? 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. God says, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Now that's a little bit challenging because we have to ask ourselves, what, what does that mean? Because a lot of people are trying to understand that. Well, God will guide you in the full meaning of that. But the scriptures are very clear with what that means to some degree. Turn back to Ephesians, but this time go to chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Does that mean that I cannot eat with an unbeliever? This is a question I get asked. And my answer to that is, you need to pray and ask God if God wants you to eat together with that unbeliever or not. Because the answer may be yes, but it may be no. We're in this world, and Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11 uh, let me begin back in verse 8. Verse 8, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable. The word is well-pleasing to the Lord. What pleases God? That's why you've got to take it to the Lord in prayer if you have any question about it. Go to God in prayer because we are, verse 11, to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is a shame to even speak of those things which are done by them in secret. 
can I eat with a meal with unbelievers? I may be able to. I certainly am going to work together with unbelievers, but I am not to fellowship with unbelievers. I am not to partake, verse 11 tells us, I am not to partake of their unfruitful works of darkness. I may sit down and have a meal with some unbelievers, and I may have to call out, no, that's wrong. That displeases my Lord. I will not do that. I will not drink that. I will not listen to that. I will not go there. But it's harder and harder and harder to find Christians who understand that today. It's harder and harder. These simple principles that God's word calls out clearly have been muddied by Christians who are not abstaining from fleshly lusts. Remember, number one, keep your heart pure. And they say, but I want to, I like it. Be careful, that's your old sin nature. And your old sin nature will love that kind of sinful behavior. Be careful. We're told as believers to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Does that mean I can eat with them or not eat with them? Does that mean I cannot? What, what if they want to go on a mountain climb? I also have a problem with that. That's not. But what if on their mountain climb, when they get to the top, they want to drink beer and do drugs and they want to pull out pornography? and what? Whoa! Every single one of those things now is displeasing to the Lord, isn't it? Do you see the difference? And every situation is different. You need God's help. Say, well, how will I know? How will I know? Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells you how you will know. Present yourself to the Lord, a living sacrifice, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Do you realize as a believer, if you're not, presenting yourself to the Lord, you're not yielded to him. If you are not actively keeping yourself separate from the world's sin and ways which are displeasing to God, if you are not actively renewing your mind with the truth of Scripture, Romans 12, 1 and 2, it's three simple things. Present yourself a living sacrifice. Do not be conformed to this world, the system that is full of the thinking and sinfulness of men, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I have to fill my mind in truth with God's truth. Do you know that you will be at a loss to test? That's what the word prove means. Test and show. You will be at a loss to test and show what is well-pleasing to God. Good, acceptable, holy. You won't be able to do it. You can't do it. And there's lots of Christians who won't do it and have no clue how to do it. I'll just close right now with a simple little illustration that just got my attention. I could never forget it. I have a couple different ones, but this one got my attention. Years ago, I heard on the radio that there was a man who had a job with, I, I want to say the name of the company. I don't even know it exists anymore. Might have been bought up and changed the name. He worked for a company called Seal Test. How many people does that ring a bell? Seal Test? Oh, there's three or four of you? I know Seal Test because they made... Oh, five or six of you know. They made ice cream. I love ice cream. This man had a job at Seal Test. You know what his job was? His job was to taste it. I thought, now why can't I get a job like that? I'll be glad. He was a taste tester for Seal Test. That's what he did. And it was interesting, the interview that he had. Do you know that he worked Monday to Friday tasting ice cream? I thought, this guy must weigh 600 pounds or something, you know. I don't know. It was a radio. I don't know. Do you know that he said when he went home Friday night after 5 o'clock, and all day Saturday and all day Sunday, and Monday morning before he clocked in again at 9 a.m. on Monday morning, do you know he was very, very careful about what he tasted? This is what he said. He said, I don't eat any hot sauce. We don't have Mexican. He said, by and large on weekends, I eat foods that will not damage my taste buds. Very hot, very careful about hot liquids and stuff like that. Why? That was his living. That job was his living. And his living was to do what? To taste. And apparently he had a good palate. They... They valued his tasting. 
and he didn't want to dare damage his taste buds lest he lose his job. And I thought, now there's something to take away from that, isn't there? As a believer, do we want to be very, very careful about our testimony for Jesus Christ? God's provided the truth in his word to show us how to live a holy, righteous life and honor him, even in the midst of being with unsaved family, even in the midst of being with unsaved co-workers, even in the midst of an unsituation that is turning rapidly evil because of people who have given themselves over to lewdness, the believer can stand up and say, I don't want to offend my Lord and my testimony for him. And so I'll bid you adieu. I'll bid you adieu because I want to follow my Savior. Let me tell you, I, this is just an opinion. I have to be careful about these. But I dare say we might find another person or two more coming to faith in Jesus Christ if we could find Christians who wanted to be that faithful to their Lord and say, I will abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. I will, by God's grace, recognize the sin and the sinfulness that is all about me. And by God's grace, O Lord, your spirit dwells within. Enable me, guide me to be a shining light and a testimony for Jesus Christ. You don't want me to do that, Lord. You don't want me to read that, Lord. You don't want me to taste that, Lord. You don't want me to go there, Lord. Father, thank you. It is a privilege to live for Jesus Christ. May God encourage your hearts. Let's pray. Father in heaven, may your spirit guide these truths right home to our hearts. And may we allow the spirit of God to have his will in our way that in faith we would embrace what the word of God says. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.